dictionary collection. It's built into Swift. Here we say a collection whose elements, right? We saw arrays where arrays has elements separated by commas. So we could have an array of fellows where we have a had followed by a comma, luba followed by an x comma. So here a dictionary by its nature, it's a collection whose elements are key value pairs. That's the most important part of knowing what a dictionary difference is with an array. The dictionary is made up of a key and a value, okay? Think about it like you open up your dictionary at home, looking up a word, extreme. How do you start? You gotta look for the key in that way, in that, in that way, you're looking for extreme. So you go to E, right? Then you go to EX, you get the word extreme. By extreme, it has what the thing means. That's the value. So the key is the word extreme, and the value is what extreme means, right? So that's key value pairs. That's what we mean by key value pair. We'll go deeper into what generics are, but for now, a generic is, it accepts any type. Right? It could be an integer, it could be a float, it could be a string. Generic, that's what it is. Structures, we'll get through what structures mean when we talk about structs and classes. Right? But the key here is a dictionary is made up of key value pairs. Also very important, the word hashable here. Hashable means it's going to give us a value that's unique. So for example, if I give my name, Alex, that hash value, it will return me some integer. That integer is unique to my name. If I try to use my name again as a key, I'll get a compiler error because the keys needs to be unique in a dictionary. How can you have two extremes in the book, in the uh, dictionary, right? You gotta have one extreme to one value, right? So that keeps our keys unique. Our keys needs to be unique. In order, in order for the keys to be unique, they need to be hashable. Hashable we'll get further into when we talk about data structures, but for now, just know hashable returns you a unique value, okay? So for now, just think of hashable as returning you a unique value. You give it some key, Yulia, it gets your unique value. For example, one, two, three, four, five. Somebody else comes with Yulia. It's like, hey, Yulia has been used. I've seen that number. That one, two, three, four, five, I've seen it. You can't reuse that key, right? So that protects us from ourselves here. And it ensures that the dictionary itself has unique keys. Why do we need unique keys? Unique keys enable us to quickly access any value in our dictionary. Can you imagine a dictionary with 10 instances of the word extreme? You'd go crazy. Which one is which, right? But if we go to our dictionary quickly, we look. We look up the word language, we see what it means, right? We look up the word CD, we see what it means. We see one instance of CD, we don't see many. So the key needs to be unique. Over here in the overview, it says a dictionary is a type of hash table. We talk about hash tables in unit four when we actually make our own hash table, which is in itself a dictionary. A hash table, as we said earlier, a hash value is a unique key. So think about the hash table as unique keys with some values. So an array could be thought of as an array of key values, right? where the element itself has a key and has a value, okay? In the example here, where you see 200, 200 is the key. An int could be a key. An integer is also hashable. A string is hashable. How do we know? When we talk about protocols, we talk about how to conform your type to a protocol. Int conforms to hashable. So we could use an int here, this is valid. I could say my key is 200, my value is okay. Also here I could say my key is 404, 
and my value is file not found. Those are messages that we get back from the internet. If something goes wrong or right, it gives us feedback. Like, hey, this page is not found, 404. So that's valid. That here represents a dictionary name response messages with key value pairs. Key value, key value, key value. Key value pairs. Pairs imply many. So here, my dictionary count would be what? It would be four. Because remember, you're counting the key value as one. So, and also look at the comma. So here, I would have one, I would have two, I would have three, and I would have four values. Everybody with me? So key value pairs. So it would count after every comma. So here, I would say responses, messages that count would be four. Here we have an empty dictionary. How do we see it's a dictionary or how do we know? We'll get into the syntax and typing it out in a demo. But here we have open square bracket, which we saw in arrays. But different from arrays, we have the first type followed by a colon and the value type. So the first is the key. Again, key value, key value. The first is the key. The second in that case is the value. Everybody with me? Okay, so that is the overview of a, what, what a dictionary is. Let's go to our playgrounds and actually start typing out some demos. So here we have dictionary. We said it's a collection of key value pairs. All right? Here we'll say the key needs to conform to the hashable protocol. This simply means that the Key. This simply means the key needs to be made unique by a hashing algorithm. All right. We'll get into, as I said, the intricacies of what's happening with hashing. But basically, hashable is this protocol. It provides a hashing algorithm, right? It provides a hashing algorithm. On that hashing algorithm, you put your value, it gives you back a hash value. As we said before, so I could have, for example, a name of Alex hash value equal to the string Alex dot hash value. Right. So as we see, hash value returns an integer. So now I will print hash value of, actually, let's fix that a little bit. I'll take my name here. I'll put name here. I'll create a variable for name. And yeah, that's better. So here, hash value of name is hash value. Okay. In order for us to know why, it's better to show us the example here, right? So here, Alex is a name, some string. I say string dot hash value because a string conforms to hashable. We'll see what conforming all those things mean when we start talking about protocols. But name that hash value for now, just think about it. It gives you that property. It returns you back an integer, which is unique to the string Alex. 
In that case, now I say hash value of name Alex is whatever the hash value is. I'll go ahead and run it. And it gives me some integer, right? For you guys, it will be a different integer. If you put in my name, as a matter of fact, put my name, and you'll get a different integer. Do we agree? Right? By the nature of it, let's also put in our dictionary here. By the nature of what just happened, it's unordered. A dictionary is unordered, right? They're unordered collections. Every time you run, the algorithm itself runs, the algorithm brings you back a different key. So in the dictionary itself, there's no way to know if element zero is zero. You can't index using element zero in a dictionary based on what we just saw. If you put my name in, it gives you a different number every time, right? By the nature of it, it runs that algorithm every time. There's no guarantee for order here. All right, so that's like a brief introduction to what hashing and hash values gives us. But the hash value here, for people interested, you could go read more about hashing and what the hashing algorithm looks like. Not in the current scope, but that's what hashing is. It gives us a unique value, okay? All right, great. So let's keep going. Yes, the question. Every time you run it, every time you run it, it's going to change, everybody? Every time you run it on whatever you name you have, that hash value is going to change. Every time I run it, it we talk about more hash tables. So like it's difficult to talk about dictionaries without really saying what hash tables are. But every time you run the program, it creates a new hash algorithm in order to know what where it should fit that bucket. We'll get into it further. Okay? But that's where we're headed. Okay, but for now, just know hash values return your unique key. And you need a unique key for the actual key in the dictionary. They need to be unique. Cool, and we'll see why and how. All right, great, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so let us create a header here to start initializing and testing out our theory behind what dictionaries are, how they work how we could not have the same keys and all that stuff. All right, so here, initializing and populating dictionaries. Okay, as in the Apple documentation earlier, you could start a dictionary by giving it some variable name. Here we'll say name of integers assign it here using the initialization method. So this example method, we we'll call it method one, uses the initialization method. What I mean by that, I create some variable name, I initialize it using the initialization method. What that means is I actually explicitly say the type. That's not type annotation, right? I have the open square bracket. I have the key. Key is the first value. So I'm saying my keys are going to be ints, integers, followed by a colon, followed by the value, right? So key value, key is integer, value is a string, followed by open parens, close parens. It's like, hey, go ahead, create this, empty dictionary, right, using the parents here, empty. Great. So now I could actually go ahead and assign a key value pair to name of integers. Let's verify our count. So here, count number of elements in name of integers. 
What would be a good property name for counting the number of elements in a dictionary? What would be a good property name? Dot, dot count, right? Tanaya, oh, Zara, right? Dot count, right, would be a valid name here. And we can use dot count here as well. We saw dot count on strings so far. We've seen dot count on arrays, everybody, right? A collection, you want to count how many items? Dot count is it. Tell me how many elements in that dictionary. What's the expectation? What's the answer? If I say name of integers that count, zero, right? According to Eddie, because currently there's no elements. We just declared initialize an empty dictionary. So here we've declared and initialized an empty dictionary. P is int P is of type int value is of type string. Right? Okay, so now we said we wanted to count, so let's have print there are String interpolation, there are currently, there are currently in the name of integers dictionary. Right? And here in our string interpolation, we'll say there are name of integers that count. Count is a property on dictionaries. As a matter of fact, count is a property on collection, the collection protocol. You can even put that here. So count is a property on the collection protocol. And then here we will say, uh, Dictionary and arrays confirm. Does it make more sense later as we do our protocols? Dictionary array sets and sets conform to collection. Yes, sir. Oh, that's fine. So um, a property, right? So we haven't spoken in depth about properties, but they're coming. So a property is a variable or constant on a type. What does that even mean? Well, we have seen variables. We have seen constants or, or, or. We have seen variables, right? We know what a variable is. Right, it's data storage, we put some value in there. We've seen constants, correct? A type, right? Int is a type. String is a type, right? Array is a type. So saying a property is a variable or constant on a type is basically saying you have a type, which we haven't gotten into structs or classes, but you have some object in that object has variables, right? It has methods or functions available to us, right? So I could say in my array, I want to use the variable called count. So that's referred to as a property. Everybody with me? We'll go into properties by itself and methods, we'll talk about it. But for now, think of a property as either a variable or a constant on that type. So now we're saying the type here is an array, right? The type is an array, and the property we're after, the variable, is called count. Everybody with me? We'll get more into it, but the count here is a variable. Cool, good. Good, good, good. So there are x count currently in, let's run this playground, see what we have. Okay, so there are currently, there are zero elements, Mr. Paul. 
Okay. There are currently zero elements in name integer dictionary. Run it again. All right. There are zero elements currently in the name of integers dictionary. Everybody got that? There's zero. There's nothing. It's empty. So now let's go ahead and add stuff to it. Right below, I will assign a key and value pair to it. Here we can actually say element. An element is made up of a key value pair. Assign a key value pair to name of integers. Again, key value pair by itself is one element. We'll see what that looks like. So now we want to assign one element to our dictionary. So here, name of integers. The key expects an int. So here I say 16. And it expects the value to be of type string, 16. Let's go over that. So we see subscripting. I'm not accessing like an array subscript here. Here, basically what the 16 values is the key. Give me the value at that key. The key is 16. Assign it the value 16, right? Assign it the value 16. My key is 16. My value is what? 16 string, right? The, the key is 16, the, the, the integer 16. The value is string 16. Let's see what that looks like. So now I could just say print my entire dictionary, name of integers. Print it out. Let's open up the debug area a little bit more. In your console, you should now see key is 1.6, value is 16 in quotes, key value pair, right? That's how you assign a value to your name of integers dictionary here, right? Let's see some more examples. Uh, oh, okay, uh, thank you. So um, Luba is saying, if we do dot count now, what is the value? Everybody agrees one? So there are elements. I'll just make it shorter. I was going to copy it, but I'll just make it shorter. So there are uh, name of integers that count. There are zero elements now. OK, so now if we run it. Luba. Luba says we expect one. There are one elements now. Do we see that? Right? Because as we printed, our dictionary has a key value pair. Together we count it. It's only one. If there were more, it would be followed by commas, correct? As we add to it, there's more. So if we come down here, let's keep adding. Actually, you guys go ahead and add one. Add some whatever integer you want. I'll wait for you. Uh, 30 seconds. Add any integer to our, using that syntax on 30, add any integer to our dictionary and print out your dictionary and make sure it has two, at, at, most, at, most, at least two. So practice add a different key value pair. You could have negative number, it's up to you. Negative, positive, a million, five. Yes, sir. So if I assign uh, name of integers So good question. Everybody did their practice? Okay, so let's just create a new one and then I'll come to your question. 
So let's go. Um, what do we do? So name of integers. I say seven, for example. Equal to the string seven. And did you go ahead and print out your dictionary? Did we print out our dictionary? Okay. So if we print out, now we should have two elements. Everybody should have gotten two elements, right? Yes? So far so good? Followed by a comma. Each element is followed by a comma. If we say print that count, name that count, name that count is? Name that count is? Two, right? Two elements? Okay. Um, so next question was, can we index zero? Can we index the first element using this? Because we agree there's more than one element, correct? Right? There's two elements. So can we index zero into our array? That was the question. Let's see what happens. So now we try to say name of integers index zero. Right? In that case, there's nil because zero doesn't have an element yet. It works. The only reason why it works, by the way, is because our key happens to be an int. Right? Later, we'll see in an example where our key is a string. We will try to index it with zero. It's going to say, can't subscript with an integer. Good question. Again, the only reason why this is valid, everybody, is because the key is valid int. Everybody with me? So far, so good? Let's stay here and do optionals. Why we like optionals. Yes. Oh, when you reprint. Remember, we, we saw the hash value earlier? OK. Next excellent question. Why every time I rerun it, the orders change? I like that. So Luba is saying, or she identified, every time she runs her playgrounds, even if she put the order 12 first and then followed by some other number, it prints in a different order. We saw that because, as we said, the hash value actually changes. Remember? Every time that hash value changes, I really don't want to get into data structures algorithms, but every time that um, we run it again, basically, it changes the position of where that hash value goes. So it does a mod operation on the hash value. If I have two, two values here, it does a mod operation. Wherever that um, value ends up, it could be anywhere. Right? Think about it that way. Like the first time the hash value might be four. Four mod two, zero, right? The next time that value might be five. Does it go into zero? No, it goes into one. So that hash value is always different. Our positions are always different. There's no order there. It's unordered. Cool? Very good question. All right. That first example is going to work here again because. because our key is an int. So this is valid. <laughs> Believe it or not, we'll see later how it's not valid or how it could always not be valid. Here is valid just because the key is an int. Everybody with me? So I say, go ahead, find me the key. What this is saying is, find me the value where the key is zero. This is what this is saying. Let's write it down. Find, uh, find the code below. Says find me the value where the key is zero. All right? This is what this is saying. Find me the value where the key is zero. We printed it correctly. Did we print it? It should have been nil earlier. Let's run it again. Oh, I'm not printing. Oh, but it's nil here, right? Do we see in the playgrounds? It's nil, right? It's nil because look, this returns an optional. We love optionals. So let uh, num equal to. Option click on num. What type is num? 
What type is noun? It's an optional string. We look for the key, zero. The value returned to us is an optional. Right? There's no guarantee that there's a key, there's a value for that key, which makes perfect sense. Right? It makes perfect sense here. Because in our example, we haven't added any value for the key zero. Did we add that? No. So how can we return an integer? We cannot, or a string, sorry, we cannot. There's no guarantee that the, that number exists in the dictionary. You might look up some old dictionary and not find a word. That's possible. It's not there, it doesn't exist. So the dictionary returns to you an optional value. And we love optional so much, we could figure out what optional bind, um, what optional unwrapping we want to use here. Which one do you want to use? You go. Which one do you want to use? Nil coalescent. Okay. So here, a mini search wants to use nil coalescent. What is your default value? It has to be a string. Zero is fine. That's fair. But that's also, that could lead to a problem. Oh, oh, zero. Okay. Great. So now we have zero, which is a string. Now, what type is our num? If we option click, what type is num? It's a string. The optional is gone. Because here we use nil coalescent, which we saw earlier, to unwrap our, our dictionary. Very powerful. Right? So now we could print. num is whatever num is here in our case what's num right it is zero because there's no value for that key that's where optionals and everything comes together if everything uh, different data types in your keys yes you could have i mean we we, we let's go back so we assigned, or we rather declared, the key to be an integer. And we said the value is a string. You could also say your key is a Boolean. <coughs> Valid. You could say your key is a double. You could say your key is a string. As long as that key is what? What's the key word here? In the beginning of the, I heard it. I heard it. No, there's a term that we use to open up the lesson. As long as that key conforms to hashable, right? As long as that key conforms to hashable, it could be a key. It could be your own custom type. Stephanie conforms to hashable. I could put Stephanie in here, right? If that's a valid type. Right? If Stephanie is a valid type that conforms to Hashable, Stephanie could be a key. Any key that conforms to Hashable could be a key here. In our case, we are using int, right? Because what we're trying to capture, we're trying to capture, hey, the key is an integer, 5, 10, whatever. What is equivalent as a string? That's what we're trying to capture with our dictionary. Everybody sees that? So that dictionary is able to capture what the integer type looks like or written as and what the string value is. So the 11, 1, 1 would be 11 spelled out, 11. Everybody with me? So again, key value, so you, you, you're looking it up. So figure like you have a kindergarten app, like you're making a kindergarten app. And then um, when the person clicks on some card, it shows the number five, and then it gives them some scrambles. And in those scrambles is the string 11, 10, 1, whatever. They got to pick one of those. They pick one of those. It maps to your key. Is that the value for me? Yes, they get a point. They move on to the next one. Do we see that? Right? So that's like a use case for that there. Question. How do we know if the How do we know? Yeah. In our case, you, in our documentation, well, first of all, it would tell you. The compiler would tell you right away if it's hashable or not. It would give you a compiler error. That's the, that's, the, that's the quickest way. That's the quickest way. So for example, I really don't want to get to that one, but um, let's do an example here. 
Everybody with me? Let's go to the bottom. Brief intro to structs. Person. Okay. So if I have some struct person, we'll get into that, please, um, later. But I have some struct person, it's an object, and I have some uh, person dictionary here. And I use our syntax earlier, I'll say person is mapped to some integer this way, right? And let's see, so it's telling me referencing initializer on dictionary requires that person conform to hashable, right? The compiler is already telling me, hey, you're trying to use some key that does not conform to hashable. My person type, we'll get into structs, my person type does not conform to hashable. Impossible to make this guy a key right now, right? Bienvenido. See that? Does that answer your question? The only way is to make this guy, I'm really getting into unwanted territory here, right? The only way to make that person be happy in a dictionary is to make this person conform to hashable. Brief intro to structs and protocols in one minute, right? So here we have the struct called person, we conform to hashable using the conform syntax here, colon hashable. And now person is hashable by nature, and person could be a key. Everybody with me? But let's scrap that, please. But that was the, the answer to your question. How do we know if something conforms to something else? One, you could look at the documentation for that type, see if it conforms. Two, just test it out and see what the compiler says. In that case, if it's not hashable, you get an error message saying, the key needs to be conforming to hashable. Cool? But all the types we've seen so far conform to hashable. Bool, ints, floats, all those types. Stephanie, you had a question. Um, how do we access the key that we train? We get into that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we get into that now. So let's see, we're comfortable with uh, initializing our dictionary here. Great, this is perfect. We only saw method one, believe it or not. Method one was just to use an initialization here. Square bracket, the type followed by a colon, type followed by parents. Let's see the other way. Let's just see the other way using a literal, actually. Yeah, let's use a literal, great. So method two. Here we'll create some dictionary, call it airports, right? We'll use type annotation. We'll say it is a string. The key is a string. And we'll say the value is also a string. So far so good? So here we're using type annotation, right? Colon followed by the type. In that case, the type is a dictionary. How do we know it's a dictionary? It uses dictionary syntax. This is dictionary syntax here, right? It's open square bracket, the type, colon, the value. And we'll just use a literal here. Actually, I want to show you one thing. I'll comment it out. Um, so here, this is valid as well. That syntax, that works. If you see it, it compiles. Right, it compiles. Right, what's the count of airports? Zero, right, everybody agree? It's zero, it got initialized with an empty dictionary. If you see this, don't run away, run towards it. You know what it is. I will comment it out, but this is valid. This is valid. Let's just say valid here. Valid empty dictionary. Great. But we don't want an empty dictionary. We want to have a dictionary literal. We saw what literal arrays look like. This is a literal array. Literally an array, right, followed by commas. This is a literal array. A literal string 
is literally two quotes, the name of the stream, right? A literal dictionary, our quote, followed by some quote. This too is also valid. Because remember, the key is a string, the value is a string. In that case, it's just empty. Both of them are empty. But we don't want to have empty airports. What's the point of that? So we'll start off with Copenhagen. Copenhagen is in Denmark. And we'll say the code is CPH. At this point, what's the count of my airports? One. Let's keep a running count here. So print there are X airports. Currently fit. So here I'll say airports dot count and run that. And I get back. There are one airports currently. Okay. That's good. Let's keep adding more. Comma. So this is one element, right? So it's key value. Follow uh, in between colon, right? Key value. Next one we have, we will say Los Angeles. Sure. And then we have here LAX. Then we could have San Lucia. Okay. LCU, maybe. Oh, comma. Okay, so here, what's the count? Three, right? So we look for the commas. Each comma is one. So here we have Copenhagen, which is one. We have Los Angeles, which is one. We have St. Lucia, which is the last one. So far, so good? Let me see if I could format that. Okay, so this is a little better. You could press uh, return after every comma to make it look better. Okay, so here we have airports. We have three in our airports. So far, so good. And by the way, I also want to tell you this is also valid. So we could do it this way, or we could have done we could have done our declaration, and then we could have done our assignment like that. Okay? I want to show you guys everything that compiles. So this compiles, or you could put actually let's just put comment here and just put the literal like that. With an example, yeah, that's better. So you have better notes. Okay, you could do it all on one line, or you could type annotate and assign it later. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, you could assign it all at once here, or you could break it up, declare it first, and as you're going through, you could assign it later. So those are the syntaxes so far. Accessing values, that was the big question, Miss Stephanie. Uh, one second, I'll come right back down. Just trying to get a header here. Accessing values. Is everybody done typing, by the way? Everybody done typing? Yes, no? Yes, okay, cool. So accessing values. I want to mention there's also an is empty um, property on dictionaries. Right? So you could say like if airports 
that is empty, else print there are airports. Reports that count, and here I can say print reports is empty. Okay. In that case, we'll get the count because our airport is not empty. Correct. Okay. Let's see. Do we have we have our array, our dictionary of. Let's create a new dictionary, new dictionary, and call it looping through. Looping through. Or a dictionary. So here I will initialize some dictionary, I'll call it cities. I'll specify that it is string and string. So what's the first string here? What does it represent in the dictionary? It's the key, right? And the second is the? The value, very good. Okay, so here I will say uh, Sweden, Say Stockholm. Let's call this bucket list. Okay, cool. So Sweden, we got Stockholm, great. We have Australia, our favorite destination. And we have Kent. We have Mexico. And we have Cozumel. Any from the crowd? Any from the audience? Where do you want to go? Bucket list. New Zealand. New Zealand. That's the entire country, yeah? OK. Wellington. Morocco. What's, it, what's the, the entire thing? OK. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll say Casablanca. Cool. So we have our bucket list. It's great. And then let's use a follow up. We love follow ups. So we'll say for. Let's see, what things actually I do first with that. Okay, so for key value in bucket list. Let's stop there for a second, go over the syntax. So for key is the first um, in our array, not array, in our dictionary, the first value is a key, correct? So here I'm using some variable name. It could be any name. I could actually say country and maybe city, right? Something like that. So it doesn't matter the name. We saw that earlier in every four we've written. So far so good? 
So the name is up to you and the context of the question. So let's go back to key value for now. So key value in buckets, which is our dictionary, which is fine. I'll say print Actually, let's name that country and destination, place maybe. OK. Then you can say, I want to visit place located in country. Great. So I want to visit X located in country, right? That's valid. I'll go ahead and run my for loop. <clears throat> right, so it loops through my dictionary. It sees the value and the key, right? Here, this is the value and that's the key. Key is country, do we see that? Right, so country is the key here, the first variable. Second variable is the value. I want to visit, visit, right? Second value is place. Doesn't matter how we type, how we put it in our string interpolation, right? But more importantly, the first variable has access to the key. The second has access to the place, the value. Where do you want to go in that country? So I want to visit Stockholm, located in Sweden. I want to visit Cairns, located in Australia, Casablanca, and so forth. In your for loop, you could also have if let statements or whatever you're looking for, right? If somebody tells you, hey, if you're going to Mexico, then maybe try out the burritos over there. It will change your life, right? Whatever that case is, right? So you could get a question now and have enough tools to, to use to, to get the answer. So this is basically looping through a dictionary, right? Let's see how to access a particular key, right? Where do you want to go in New Zealand? Let's see what that looks like. So destination. You start off with the name of the dictionary. In that case, it is bucket list. The key that you're looking for, or rather the value you're looking for, you have to provide the key. Can we use indexing as we saw earlier? Let's see what happens, right? Crash. Cannot subscript, come back to me. Cannot subscript a value of type string with argument of type int. It worked earlier because it just happened that the keys were integers. But you cannot subscript using what we know in arrays to access the first element in a dictionary. There's no way to do that. You have to access dictionaries by their keys, right? So here, if I want to access New Zealand, like the place you want to go in New Zealand, I have to put in the key here. And be careful, if you type it out wrong, it's not going to be correct. You'll get nil. So New Zealand here, spelled out New Zealand. Let's see what we get back for destination. Print destination. Right. I print out destination. It isn't optional. Because remember, do I have new in there? I don't have new in there. Do I have a place called new? I don't. So there's no guarantee what you're looking for exists in the dictionary. So it has to return you an optional. As we saw earlier. Right? So here we could use our favorite Neil Coalescent syntax to say unknown. Unknown destination. And now if we option click on destination, we see it's a regular string. Our warning also goes away because the compiler is able to just print out a string without any coalescing or any describing what the string is. So now we're able to run our playgrounds and see destination is Wellington. Everybody? Right? Let's actually put some better text in there to say uh, destination is uh, 
right? Or your next destination, right? Let's run it again. Get a better console log here. So your next destination is Wellington. So we are able to access the value of a given key using dictionary access and syntax. You could only access with subscripting using the key here. We can say 012, like regular arrays. Yeah. Um, if you want, if it makes you comfortable, that's fine. But just think of the only way to access a value is through the key. So subscripting with a dictionary inside the subscript is only a valid key. Cool? Does that make sense? Yeah. So subscripting with a valid key. That's how you access the value. Exactly. And if it's nil, it will return you. That's why we have to optionally unwrap it here, because it could be nil. I mean, build up on the dictionary, you mean? Yeah. You might want to start thinking about structs and classes when you get more complicated, because it only stores key values, right? So, two for now, you could have an array of values, but to make your example clearer, it would be like an object where each place has maybe a subregion, mm -hmm. and then in what intent you want to go to a subregion there, and the subregion itself has an array or a dictionary. You see where I'm, you see where I'm going with that? So the, um, the closer we get to object-oriented programming, you're able to encapsulate what you want to do into an object, right? Where you're not limiting yourself with a dictionary. Make sense? Uh, a place where you have a music artist, right? Like, let's create like an artist. Let's, let's do that now. So for example, let us create a new one. Better examples are good. Um, Spotify, Spotify, whatever, artist. Very similar to kind of what we had last week. But here, each of you give me your artist and your favorite album. Go. Yes. You hit that question. Artist name. John Mayer. Album. <laughs> Next person. Come on, let's exchange cultures and music taste here. Next person. What's the name of the artist? Uh, I'm, I'm old, so I don't know. What's the name? Post Malone? Okay, and uh, favorite album? That's a good question. Wait. Okay, while I change my verbal name, favorite albums. Favorite albums. You said Stony? Yeah. Like Stony, like this? Okay, next person. We'll get two more. Let's go. I know, right? Uh, Jaheed, favorite artist, album? Tupac, okay. Album? All eyes on me. Okay. Last person. Drake. Drake. Did you say Tinky? What? <laughs> yes? Cool? I want somebody on the East Coast. Eastern region of the world. What? Oh, wait, why are you having multiple here? Uh, spell Tiana. A N. A. A. Okay. K T. K T S E like this. What is it? K oh wow, fancy. Man, I'm old. Um, cool. K T S E. That's it. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, cool. So we have. A uh, favorite album's yeah. dictionary here, right? So um, we could also iterate through that favorite album and look for a specific person and print out their album, right? 
So we could do a couple of things. One, we could search. I could search for the artist based on album. Let's do that. So here, search for album. Well, search for given. Somebody gave you some question here. Given uh, album name, find the artist. All right? Valid. We have the album names. How can we do that? We did the earlier one where we had the uh, subscripting, right? On this key. Everybody? How can you attack that problem? Anybody want to start? Given the album name, for example, All Eyes on Me, who's the artist? That's the question. With, the co with our coding abilities, we, are, we, we, we need to do this. How can we start? What's the first thing we do? Where do we start? What keyword? Somebody that's not, I mean, what's that? Assign a variable. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, the artist name. So the minute you say let artist name, you cannot change it, right? Remember that. Okay, so for artist name, okay. Equal to favorite albums here. Okay. Square brackets. It's, we don't know the artist's name. We know the album name. Okay, you're looking for Stony. But we have a problem. Let's see. Well, I don't know if we have a problem. Let's run first and see. Uh, let's print out artist name. Right? So far, so good? Okay, so let's print out artist name and see what comes up. It's Neil! Why is it Neil? Anybody? Right? So that's very important there, right, Luba? So here, Eddie's saying Stony doesn't exist as a key. Right, because you have to look for, is it here? We haven't, there's no artist named Stony, And you can't access values using subscripting. You have to use a for loop, right? You have to loop through it. While looping through it, you have, you have access to the country name, oh sorry, not country name, you have access to the value, in that case, the album name, and the artist together as key value pairs. So as you're looping through it, you look for that artist name. If you find it, now we could assign artist name to whatever the current value is, right? So there's two things. One, are you searching for the, for the value, which is pretty straightforward. You have the key, you have the value, you're done. As we did earlier in that example here, right? Given the key, no problem. Given the value, there's a problem. Because now you can't just say subscript value because it searches for that key. Everybody with me? It assumes this value that we just gave it there is a key because that's the key syntax here. But there's no Stony, so we get back Neil. That makes sense. There's no artist called Stony. So how can we do it? I'll keep your variable name. That's fine. I'll make it empty. So far, so good? Everybody? I know lunch is coming. It's that time of the day, huh? All right, we'll use a for loop. We'll say for our key. What's our key here? Artist, right? And our value, we'll say album name. That's valid, right? Everybody? Okay, and here we'll say in favorite albums. Right? Given the album name. So we are looking for Stony, correct? Yes? Okay, so here we will say, we love our ifs, right, because they check for things. So we'll say if album name equal to Stony assign it to artist name. We have artist name. 
this artist name here the current artist we're looking at so here the current artist is whoever um, made that album everybody with me this current artist here is whoever made that album and that album if that album equals to the current album it's also the current artist do we agree do we agree here so here we could actually just rename this to current artist if that reads better current artist also make this guy current artist so you will you will get it you are on the right page but the only difference is you can subscript the value we have to loop through it find it and now assign it right and here we could print it luba to say um album well What is it called? Artist name created the. We we'll just say Tony here. We probably should have a variable. Okay, so here at the end of our for loop, either we found or we didn't. So actually, a good, a good default would probably be not found. Right, not found. We did not find the thing. So if it never came in here, not found will be printed here. Right, everybody with me? Everybody with me? Okay, so let's go ahead and run that program. And here we find Post Malone, actually. Right? Post Malone created the Stony album. So this is how you use a for loop to search for a key. So here, we could put some notes and say, yeah, ta -ta. using a for in loop to search for a given value. And later, we'll write up top using a key to find a given value to using a key to find the value, which is straightforward. You just subscript into it. Let's go 115, and then we'll come back at 215, OK? There's some critical things I want to show you. So we'll change the mid the midday check-in to 2.15, no, to whatever, to 2.15 to 3 o'clock. Cool? I want to show you guys a couple more things before we leave. Okay, so far so good. So we know given, yes. Uh, okay, so let me just copy. Cool. So that gets us up to speed. I'll let you guys um, make sure the code is good. Give you a minute for that while I tidy up things here. Things I want to show before we end here. I want to show us how to get values from a dictionary, how to get keys from a dictionary. Yes, sir. Oh, you sure? Okay. And then, what's your question? And as I said, we'll, we'll let's see. Dictionaries are unsorted. So. Sort 
sort the values and then Okay, I think those are essential. And then we are good. Cool. Everybody up to speed with what I slacked out? So we're going through three mini topics and then we'll wrap up. Shouldn't be too long. So get the values from a dictionary. What that means is we could basically say let values here, some constant. And our dictionary, we have artist, right? What do we have? We have favorite albums. What do we have? Favorite albums. Do, 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 do. What do we have? Okay, we have favorite albums. So array. Got values, for example. So here we could take all the values, extract all the values from a given dictionary using that syntax, right? Array initializer, right? Array initializer, favorite albums, which is the dictionary, get me all the values. So here we are extracting all the values from the favorite albums dictionary. If you option click on what values are, we get back an array of strings, which makes sense because our values were strings. So now I could iterate using the for loop what the albums are. So for album in where should I uh, change that actually. Just call that albums for album in albums print album is whatever the album is here. <clears throat> so if you're only interested in the values in a dictionary, that would be the way to go. Get me an array, array syntax here, initializer. Get me some array, pass in the favorite albums dictionary. That values, right? Get me all the values. Same applies for the keys. If I'm only interested in the keys, in that case, artist, I start out with my array initializer, right? Followed by favorites or favorite albums dot keys. If we option click on artist, again, it's an array of strings. So I could also do for loop here for artist in artist print artist is who the artist is. So dictionaries are, are slightly more powerful than arrays. They store more values. There's more flexibility of what you could do. Let's print what that looks like. Okay, so here we have all our albums, right? Album is KTSE. We have room for squares, take care, Stony, all eyes on me. And then we have our artists, right? Tiana, John Mayer, Drake, Tupac, right? So we are able to extract all the keys, if we're interested in that. We are able to extract only the values, if we're interested in that. Everybody with me? Very powerful. And lastly, let's see, actually I'll keep that example up here. So as I said, uh, yeah, actually we'll do a new, a new example. We'll do a new example. So as I said, dictionaries are unsorted. So you're given a question, hey, print me the dictionaries in order, right? Print me the artist in order or the values in order, meaning 
uh, the album names. I want them sorted by album name. Right? The way it is on the dictionary, you cannot do it. You have to go ahead and say, hey, I want to sort it either by the values or the keys. You can say dictionary that's sorted and expect it to be the same outcome. It gives you a set of tuples. So how can we achieve that? Given, given albums sort by album name, for example. Right, so we want to sort by album name. In that case, we we're interested in the values. Or the next question could be, given albums, sort them by artist name. It could be either or. What are you interested in? So for, let's see, we'll go for key or for artist name in, what's the dictionary? Dictionary is favorite albums dot keys. Option click on artist name gives us a string. So far so good. And it's not sorted yet, so let's sort it. That's the first time we'll see dot sorted. You could also dot sort an array. So on the keys, we'll say dot sorted. Here, sorted gives you alphabetical by default. Alphabetical means from A to Z. So sorted by default is ascending. Get familiar to ascending too. Basically, what that means is, so sorted by default is ascending means A to Z. So ascending is from smaller to largest. You also see descending. In that case, it would be from Z to A. So descending is Z to A. Right. We'll talk more about like sorted and uh, higher order functions and stuff like that later when we talk about closures. So by next week, we'll get familiar with like sorted, how to make it ascending, descending. Um, and so forth. So for now, sort it out of the box, does it alphabetical. Everybody with me? Alphabetical by default. So now let's just go ahead and print. We just print the artist name, so artist name sorted is whatever the artist name is. Go ahead and run that. All right. So if we see it sorted, correct? We have Drake, John Mayer, Post Malone, Tiana, and Tupac. Everybody with me? Yes? We could reverse it, but we'll stop there. Okay? On sorted, if we just say dot reversed, it reverses the thing. But we'll stop here. A lot of material. Wow, oh, you see Luba, Luba wants to go there. See that? All right, we'll go there. Blame it on Luba, not me. Um, reversed. There's a dot reversed. Make sure you're taking dot reverse that returns you an array. Not reverse, but reversed. All right, everybody? So use dot reversed and go ahead and play. Right, and now we have to pack first, which makes sense. All right, in that case, that would be descending order. Everybody with me? Cool. So any questions? Great. So we'll end our dictionaries here. Thank you very much.